of, re of rebirths, the individual has gradually matured a personal entity, an individuality. This uh, individuality is based upon the accumulated wisdom, the accumulated experience, and to a large measure also, the accumulated wisdom which has come to him. This accumulation has resulted in a great generalization of abilities which we overlook. It does not follow that an individual like Stradivarius was a violin maker since the dawn of time, because back a little ways there were not any violins. But he was developing talents, abilities, which gradually came together to provide him with a kind of genius. And this genius to the Greeks was not a quality but a being, the genius in us. This genius is a composite, subconscious, subjective record of the totality of our experience. It does not necessarily represent a continuity because in many instances the life of the individual is violently changed, but it is always a record of a relationship between the individual and his environment. It began perhaps in the Stone Age or earlier, but it was always a struggle on the part of the individual to attain security in, an, in a hazardous environment. We are still struggling for the same thing. But unfortunately, we are not making use of the accumulated resource of previous experience. Because it is not consciously remembered, it is ignored. And we have no way of explaining the various intuitions, hunches, feelings, pressures that do arise within ourselves. These pressures divide naturally into a number of levels. On one level, these pressures are simply the perpetuation of mistakes, which continue to pound us and annoy us until they are corrected. Another level of these pressures is imagination, intuition, the individual becoming inwardly aware of values greater than the commonplace. Most of our great teachers in uh, philosophy and religion, the great idealists, the great sociologists, the utopians, all these people are born with a strong summation within themselves of what they have gone through in the past, why it was not sufficient, and how in the present embodiment they can make use of that which has gone before. Physically, we can say we build upon history, but there is another kind of history, records within ourselves, records within the flesh, the bone, the nerve, the artery, the glands, pressures within ourselves that bear witness to ages of conditioning. Now, it is not at all seemly that all this record, this internal achievement pattern, should be completely wasted. The fact that we do not consciously remember it is largely due to the fact that we have been taught not to consciously remember it by our environment. Some small child who precociously exhibits genius as a cause of joy to some and a cause of problems to others. We know that such things happen. We know there are people born in this world to play the piano. We know there are people who are born to paint or to write good poetry. We know there are some here that are born for sciences and philosophies, and others are, by pressure within themselves, inevitably drawn to religion. These attractions do not arise from the superficial relationships of life. We know definitely that uh, a great variety of so-called talents come into life with us. We tried to solve all this with the law of heredity, and it did not work. We find that there is no physical heredity consistent enough to explain the peculiar genius of individuals. 
Many very famous and important creators have come from environments in which there was no background in any way comparable to what was attained. And again, these very geniuses very often do not transmit their skills or their abilities to progeny. And very often, the, the children of genius are mediocre. There is something else that determines these things. And that something is the record the individual carries within himself. He doesn't have the details but he does have a balance sheet which he brings with him in which the assets and liabilities, the credits and debits, produce a peculiar type of internal integration. An integration uh, which is going to dominate life if this is permitted. Now this record of integration is not primarily uh, built around material success. If we go back, assuming that the individual was um, born many times on this earth, go back a few hundred or a few thousand years, and practically all of the activities with which we are familiar today were in a very incipient state. There were no great economists, because we were not even concerned with an economic system, primarily. There were very few great leaders in any field, and very few skills were developed that correspond to our computerization today or to the advancements we now know in the sciences. It was an entirely different type of progress. It was a progress intended to release the conscious power of the person, to help the individual to grow, for growth is nothing more or less than the unfoldment and revelation of potential. Growth is, in truth, the individual becoming slowly but inevitably that which he was destined to be in the beginning. And to fulfill his destiny, the individual has to move his levels of estimation, realizing that the institutions we have today will pass away as did those who went before, which went before. The laws, the national integrations, the entities with which we are now familiar are part of a passing pageantry. The world will change, for nothing is changeless but change. And much of the experience that we gain today in various arts and sciences will be of comparatively little use in a different type of social integration. But the experiences of growing, the experiences of gradually unfolding inner verities through transient physical manifestations, these experiences continue to accumulate. So we must finally, it seems, come to the original idea of nature, natural law and divine law, that the human being was created in the first place to amount to something and that that something is not to be judged in terms of the physical, mechanical, materialistic objectives to which we are addicted today. What we are really here for is part of the whole growth program of the universe itself. And every step that we take is, for instance, related to certain values within ourselves. One of these values is integrity. Now, integrity is something that naturally would express itself in the lives of most people. But integrity is gradually undermined by compromise. The individual trying to avoid an unpleasant experience departs from honesty. Or in order to advance his material estate, he corrupts his own mor morality. Or through weakness of appetites, he again compromises his personal virtues. Therefore, we have forever a struggle between integrity and compromise. Now this struggle can go on anywhere. It can go on in a cave. It can go on in an ancient classical culture. It can go on today and does go on in the highly economized, mechanized civilization we know. It still remains inevitably part of human character 
to do it well or to compromise. But compromise is more pressureful where the advantages of compromise appear to be more desirable. But the entire story of man's morality and ethics goes back to the problem of compromise. It looks as though nature intends that we shall develop the internal strength of integrity. Integrity is a valuable thing. It is not only valuable here, but no matter what happens to our culture, it remains valuable. And what happens to us after we depart from here, integrity is one of the most important and required factors of evolution and progress. So all through thousands of years, we may have been trying to find integrity. Some people started looking for it at a very early age in the history of society. Others even begin to struggle for it only in the middle years of the present embodiment. But always nature demands it. Nature must gradually prove to us that integrity alone fulfills natural requirement. Here we have a world that could be a rather beautiful place with many opportunities. Most of the good has been compromised through lack of integrity. Life after life, the private citizen has suffered from the dishonesty of his associates and has compromised his life by his own dishonesty. On and on this goes, and will go probably for quite a time. But each person is able to break that pattern when he realizes that it is important to do so. And the fact that conscience remains, even though it seems to be very badly undermined, reminds us strongly that the desire for integrity is innate and the desire for compromise is impermanent and due to ex external pressure. Another factor that is important in the pattern of things is the emotional pressure of life. Actually, the divine plan calls for a beautiful world. It calls for a world in which people are happy, useful, and able to achieve emotional fulfillment through the proper expression of affection, friendship, cooperation, and integrity. But most people do not achieve this. They have moved the entire emotional world down into the gratification of physical appetites of one kind or another only to discover in the end that these appetites cannot be satisfied and that no matter what we do or how we try uh, to achieve happiness from the outside and through the fulfillment of appetites, we remain miserable. This record is so long and so well established that it's a wonder that it has not received scientific recognition. But the fact is, that the individual who tries to be happy is miserable, but the individual who tries to be right comes nearer to happiness than any other mortal can come. We have many such basic characteristics. One of these, which I think is very basic, is friendship. Most people are by instinct friendly, but by experience they have become cautious and disillusioned. Friendship is no longer uh, a simple acceptance of the inevitable relationships of life. Actually, friendship is the basis of all cooperation in nature. Friendship is the emotion that could end war, end poverty, break down the barriers of isolation, and correct most of the neurotic pressures of the individual. But by false conditioning, the natural desire toward friendliness has been blocked. The individual has been exploited, therefore he will not give his friendship uh, without reservation. Yet within him he wants it. Now if each of us, or even one of us, wants the basic experience of friendship, 
It is also true that every human being has this same basic emotion. For well, these pressures come with life energy itself. The energy which supports the human being is not merely a physical energy, it is a moral energy. It not only rejoices in accuracy, it rejoices in beauty. And it has discovered that accuracy and beauty are the same thing. <laughs>